we invited all animal advocates from around the world to explore important and complex topics. Through respectful solution-based dialogue, we attempt to find common ground. Welcome to another episode of Common Ground. I'm super excited to share this episode with you where we explore the uh, relationship between human rights and the rights of other animals. This event had way more responses than our first couple events, and while I th like to think that we're getting a bit better with the promotion side of things, I think this shows that this is a topic that people want to address. With that, let's get into it! Perhaps one of the most controversial topics within the animal movement is whether animal advocates should be allies to human rights struggles. This could mean everything from actively supporting human rights efforts, to simply acknowledging the positive potential for animal rights to advance human rights, and vice versa. Those who resist this approach seem concerned that by acknowledging this potential relationship between the rights of humans and the rights of other animals, we will have to give the other animals less attention and that this will hold the movement back. But what if the opposite is true, and that being indifferent to human issues within the movement and antagonistic towards human rights in general could actually be what's holding us back? Are human rights relevant to animal rights? The first option, um, just simply that animal rights is an extension of human rights, has come out on top. However, the um, third option I know is um, uh, uh, close to our heart for a lot of us who are here um, around other animals' rights being the focus, but that human rights also being um, part included in the scope. So really differentiating between that focus versus the scope. I think the people who often claim that, you know, the other animals need, need their own movement and um, they, they need... Um, a movement to concentrate on their well-being and, uh, and in our, our, our terms, the, um, the respect for their rights. They, they, kind, of, they kind of create a, a problem, I think, which is not really there in, in the sense that uh, if you look at the, the history of the vegan society, you, you could understand it, especially with the work of uh, Leslie Cross, you could understand it in terms of focus and scope. So it is true that the vegan social movement has have always been focused on human relations with other animals but that's never been the scope of it and so it seems to me that um, some of the things that uh, some of maybe the newer activists uh, complain about is a problem that they've almost like manufactured it's not really not really there and it never has been but you know from my point of view it's all always been intertwined or entangled in David Nybert's sense so you know um, the activists that I've always known have been interested and engaged in, in both issues all the time. And it's just been seen as a, a kind of natural thing, which is something that Reagan emphasizes over and over again in his work. I actually did a survey of vegans in the United States a few years ago, uh, actually kind of looking for the prevalence of this intersectional adherence. And Although I think that this, the stereotype from outsiders is that we are too focused on animals. The actual the results from the survey, it was 300 vegans. Um, most of them were very much so interested in this intersectionality, not just value, values, but also their behaviors. They were uh, really, really engaged in other movements, like critical anti-race movements, Black Lives Matter, feminist movements, environmental movement, obviously. So I think that this this kind of, I think the results of this little informal poll support existing research that although there are a lot of folks who think we should focus on animals and just animals, they're actually in a minority in the movement. I think if we're going to be um, opposed to speciesism, we also have to be opposed to the uh, other, other forms of, uh, the interhuman forms of uh, prejudice and oppression. Uh, otherwise, we, have, we, have, we haven't got anything to really base our opposition to speciesism on. We have to be opposed to sexism, uh, racism, etc. Because we, we, we use that uh, to formulate uh, our position of opposition to speciesism. So it's vital that we, we are also opposed to those prejudices. It's really important to um, explain to people when, when I go to vegan picnics and they suddenly, they're suddenly pro-hanging, and I say, well, actually, um, it's because we don't value human life. We don't value animal life either. Because we've already separated ourselves as, as a culture, we've, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a beings. We go, right, we're up here. Now, whenever we want to denigrate someone, we immediately call them an animal. I think, I think the same can human be said rights about the and animal well. rights go together. 
Yeah, I think the opposite could be said as well. Mm. Because I think, you know, we do, we sometimes if we learn about the abuse animals suffer, it can relate the concept of abuse towards humans, people. Yeah, suffer, they're, they're and, in, and are they're able symbiotic, to put that into, aren't they? Into, into a, you know, into a concept. So um, mm. I don't think it's all one sided. Yeah, I think, I think, like you say, they link, they link into each other. Do you consider yourself to be an advocate of human rights? I think there's um, quite a lot of prone sectional work going on in, in Ireland as, um, well, a developing, I suppose, a food not bombs type project, you know, that, that, that kind of issue. But, you know, historically, I'm, I'm always, when I came into the movement, I'm always used to the idea that you were used to go on a hunt sub on a Saturday and a, and a demo or something more illegal on, on a Sunday. But then you would find yourself at a Rock Against Racism gig and, uh, uh, you know, uh, reclaim the night uh, march during the week. And there was no, there was no, there was no kind of surprise about that. Uh, you know, it was just an accepted kind of part, part of it. And I don't remember back in the day, people getting um, criticized, for example, that they were not focusing on the right thing or that they were, you know, that, you know, that's, those kind of issues. And my focus is on animal liberation. Um, but I do campaign um, in various areas of human rights, although that's a fairly probably a fairly small part of my activity, but I nevertheless uh, do that. So I started off really my sort of like activism career by kind of really in, it was all about social justice, lots of sort of like social justice issues that I was involved in. Um, and also that carried on to a lot of work in majority world countries on environmentalism and human rights sort of like issues. And that was way before I became vegan, which was only about, I don't know, six or seven years ago. But obviously that's all informed my approach to veganism and campaigning and animal rights. And what I found, you know, there's obviously the aspect of colonialism and um, neoliberalism as well, when you start to look at the systems of oppression, power and dominance. And I find, what I find is that that sort of thinking doesn't really seem to come into a lot of the uh, from what I understand when I've spoken to other vegans, a lot of them are not really informed by a sort of like that kind of systems power worldview. And that I find quite challenging sometimes. Many people are being influenced heavily by people that are still apolitical within the movement. So until we can understand that the movement's political, we're always going to be fighting this same topic of discussion because really everyone needs to be on the same page when it comes to politics and the understanding of that within the animal rights movement. I think one of the problems is there's a lot of uh, people that become um, very recently vegan. I mean, most people now that eat a plant diet, whether they can be called vegans or not, I think it's another issue. Um, most people that eat a plant diet now have only recently um, started doing so. There's been a huge increase in the numbers of people that do that in recent years, and certainly in um, certainly in the UK and I think a lot of those people aren't aware of uh, uh, other issues I mean I think people that have been around longer um, are. Do animals really care about that that's the issue I mean for a start off animals don't vote animals don't have any rights as such so you know I think we do them an injustice sometimes when we talk about some of these issues about human rights as well like I said earlier human beings have a lot of existing laws for racism, sexism, that sort of thing. Animals don't. So, you know, I wonder whether we should be concentrating a little bit more on challenging for those rather than diversifying a little bit too much along the human rights concept. But that's how I feel a little bit. I can understand both sides of the discussion. Yeah, that it looks, if you're a sort of like a, a committed um, activist against neoliberal imperialism, for example, and, but, and you're not vegan, and the vegans are sort of like, oh, yeah, you know, more vegan sausages in supermarkets. We're winning. It looks a bit rubbish. And I agree, because I think if we're going to have animal liberation, we have to get rid of neoliberalism. We have to get rid of capitalism, because these things drive um, 
destruction of the environment. And that's a huge, major form of the oppression of other animals. And the vegan movement, I think, is very focused on, it's, it's very, very narrow focus about the consumption, regarding the consumption of animal products. and doesn't look at all these other areas of, of oppression of animals. And, and, and like the climate, the climate crisis, that, that's going to wipe out huge, huge numbers of yeah. wildlife. This is, this is almost as big as, as the number of animals that are con- consumed for food in the world, this huge area of animal oppression. And it's that, driven yeah. by ne- neoliberalism and capitalism. So as vegans, we have to be opposed to those things, we, you know, of, if we want animal liberation. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, and just to make a quick point around that, the thing to me that really resonated when, you know, considering whether or not this is a political issue is, you know, we talked about, you know, giving other animals rights. To me, I'm focused on kind of a moral right perspective that they already have the rights. So it's really just respecting those rights. However, you know, down the line, possibly not in our lifetime, to me, it is about those legal rights eventually in the personhood and all those discussions. Mm-hmm. So to me, I don't know how we're going to advocate for those legal rights eventually if we don't involve politics because politicians are who make the laws. One of the very interesting um, moves forward in the legal sense is the work of Stephen Wise, who has been advocating for the attainment of personhood of a number of different animals in the US. So for example, he's looking for um, the recognition of personhood for uh, chimps in New York state. And he's begun to push the boundaries. So he's not actually looking for legislative change. What he's looking for is to get courts to recognize uh, habeas corpus for animals. There are a number of different ways in which you can bring about legal change. You can bring changes to the law um, which is always very time consuming. And I mean, that tends to operate on a single issue. Well, I suppose they're all single issues at the end of the day, because you can't go into <laughs> any legal forum and fight for everything all at once. Mm. But um, legal change from the legislator, um, that is, I think, much more political than doing what Stephen Wise is doing, his going in as an attorney and making a case for trying to push the judges to create the law basically when there isn't a specific prohibition on it. And there's a judge in the highest court in New York state who in the last year said that for him that chimpanzees aren't persons, but neither are they things. And this is an issue that's going to have to be taken up. So there's really been a breakthrough there, you know, in terms of um, the law becoming more evidence-based. We've got kind of two categories for yeses and something I'd be curious for the group is when we start to consider a pro-intersectional approach, do we consider that to require actively campaigning for human rights initiatives or simply to be an ally and not kind of be antagonistic to those initiatives? You know, if someone doesn't necessarily, if they're not active, are they still, could they still be considered pro-intersectional? My view on these issues, uh, going back to uh, what Lance said really, is that um, the other animals or do have a, a movement which focuses on on them, which is which is the vegan animal rights movement. The, the real pro intersectional position um, from from the kind of focus and scope kind of direction is that whilst these different groups who may or may not be working in alliance are doing their thing and focusing on their particular issue, the idea is that they don't get in the way of and kind of damage the um, position of of other movements. Where do you think the opposition towards human rights and a pro-intersectional approach comes from? Yeah, well, I think I think this brings up um, issues that have been, uh, as it were, um, thrown in opposition to the pro-intersectional approach. And particularly uh, that one that says that the other animals deserve their own movement. That's that's um, a common one. I am. I often respond in the way that I just did. That they, they have, they have them. It, it, it's just, it's just that that doesn't rule out a broader focus, uh, of a broader scope to things, you know. So, but I, I hear that all the time, you know. That, that well, you know, human rights, they've got all kinds of movements working for them. They don't need us as well, as it were, you know. That that seems to be the kind of thrust of that. I think um, there is a strong anti-human element to things and that's that's been around 
for, for quite a while. And I suppose everybody, in a way, you've, you've got sympathy for that. You know, you, we, we, see, we see the latest atrocity and you can have, as it were, lose face in humanity. Um, someone like Reagan would try to stay optimistic. After all, we're, our so, we're a social movement. And that means that we rely on human beings. You know, we are, we are a, a, a social movement for other animals, but we are made up of human beings. So, you know, when people say, um, oh, you know, humans are vile, humans are scum, and this kind of thing on Facebook, I always write, even the vegan ones, you know, so we've got to keep it perspective, I think, on these issues. I know for me, the whole losing um, focus of other animals, um, it brings me to the Tom Reagan quote, you know, that we can do both and should do both. And, and maybe if, if someone does have specific concerns around this, they can um, let their thoughts be known of how this might live in us by also campaigning for both things, you know, and, and, and not necessarily even campaigning, but just uh, being an ally to both ends. So, Corey, you know, in relation to the results that we've got here on the screen, would, would that, um, you know, kind of be in, in tune with the, uh, the survey that you, you, you mentioned, mm -hmm. or would that be contradictory? Yeah, so what actually inspired me to do that research, the survey was back in 2017, by the way. So this was right after the Donald Trump election. And I saw the election of Donald Trump as sort of an extension of a lot of kind of political turmoil over identity politics that were happening in America, but also in the animal rights movement. Because really, in that whole decade, we have seen a lot of vegan intersectional issues kind of coming to the forefront and causing a lot of debate and discord. Uh, so when I framed the study, I was, you know, asking them what they what they supported, what they physically supported, what their values supported. I was inspired by um, non-humans first, which now after we've been talking about this, I'm starting to wonder how much of the kind of attention that that got is due to people supporting it versus people just being outraged by it. But I did ask them in, in the survey. So after I asked, like, should, should we support this? Or is, do you feel that animal rights is in line with that? Da, 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 da. And I also asked, do you believe that we should put non-humans first? And quite, it was a, I don't have a study pulled up right now, but it's pretty consistent with that. Although we may be very intersectional, we may be deep down actually want to put non-humans first which is, you know, that's what we're doing. We're sitting here on an animal rights podcast radio show right now. We're not on a feminist podcast radio show. So we do kind of understand that although we recognize we need to be involved with these other things, we are at the end of the day investing most of our time and research and efforts in this one field. So yeah, there was kind of a bizarre support for intersectionality, but also support for the statements used by uh, non-humans first. Humans kind of rule the world as we know, more or less, so we, we think ourselves. But I was just thinking, so, you know, most humans um, like to get something back for something to do. Like, so uh, if we get people to go vegan, kind of we give them back, uh, hopefully, a better um, health and uh, a better lifestyle and a better way of thinking. So in getting people to go vegan, we... we um, we're helping them and we're helping animals. So, you know, so that's a, a good reason for human rights and animal rights. Like we're so entwined, you know. So it, it makes sense that human rights and animal rights are connected that way, you know. Understanding of the intersectional framework and particularly the value of it, and particularly for people who are, you know, uh, occupied positions of privilege is that, um, it's not so much about being proactive and doing anything, it's about avoiding trampling over other people who may or may not be in fortunate positions and disrespecting them as human beings. Uh, that was the, the, the big value, is that that intersection framework can help people learn about this and avoid maybe making things worse without necessarily having to focus on making things better. The key issue for me is that it's people that have to change. And if we're going to be effective advocates, although we can put animals first, we have to be responsive to how people are going to react. So if our advocacy involves deliberately putting people off, upsetting people, and by putting animals first, we push people away, 
that's the time we need to examine uh, that issue. And I think the idea that we can have a kind and supportive debate and discussion, help people learn about these things, is where we're going to move forward. And if we're going to just trust our young activists, it, that, that ain't going to happen. Yeah, I think that's an important point because I think um, one of the poll options was that potentially some of this, this resistance comes from negative encounters with specific individuals, which I think is a risk on both sides of this, isn't it? And that's why today I think it's really about focusing on the um, issues themselves versus necessarily the people that align with them. So appearance, sometimes I think um, advocates and activists feel like their personal appearance needs to come over the actual idea of us getting justice for animals so we have to appear to be diehard as opposed to actually being able to get into a space where we can talk so it's almost like we have too much pride or not willing to accept others faults to get like an in into a space where we might be able to be heard and if during that we actively are seen to be caring and fighting for the causes of others then it's more likely that they might start to care for the causes that we're fighting for so many people follow this avenue of thinking where you know it's like get one up on the other person any means necessary even if it means degrading them even if it's subtly if we can degrade them and win a conversation we win but it shouldn't be about us winning as activists or us as human beings it's it's about what are we actually doing and how can we leave a conversation or how can we build that bridge and not build a wall? And I think just building on that, um, coming back to Marianne's question, thank you for waiting, Marianne, is um, some activists believe that all oppression comes from the same source. What do people mean by this? And do people in this call think this is true? I understand working on human oppression is part of the solution because activists and the people we try to reach are humans and deal with these oppressions. But is human oppression also part of the problem? Do people in this chat think this and could they explain it? Um, I don't understand this position, but would like to. Um, I think one of the best resources for those who are interested in this kind of shared um, source type of thinking is the work of AFCO. AFCO comes out of a critical race background and is not necessarily, didn't come up out of the animal rights movement, but came to the animal rights movement later. And one of the things that attracted AF to the animal rights movement was this kind of um, thinking critically about what that category of animality means, what it means to be an animal. So I think that we kind of get hung up on this notion of the biology of it all, that um, my cat is different from me because of all these different reasons, but we need to be thinking about the symbolic meaning of it. So it's kind of like the construction of race. Like what is race? We get bio we're stuck on the biological part. Well, it's about skin color or hair texture, but who cares? What's the big deal? The deal is that that symbolic meaning. So it's the same reason that we don't really think twice about the color of someone's eyes or if they can hold their pinky. I make my students try that. Can you hold your pinky straight or can you curl your tongue? These are biological differences between people, but we are assigned the symbolic meaning and that's the symbolic meaning that we're interested in. So we have to move away from that kind of biological differences between humans and other animals and start focusing on that symbolic meaning of that category animal that was really created at the turn towards modern, modernism and human society in the West. So when we're looking at the rise of colonialism, the category of animal really came into its own. So colonizers, the dominant class would use that category and say, well, you're, you're not human, you're not rational, you're unclean, you have um, no civility about you, you are very rudimentary in your behaviors and all these sort of things that we associate with being an animal, but we've used that category as humans, as oppressors, we use that category for racial groups, gender groups, all sorts of different groups. So what AF is asking us to do, and by the way, I have her books right here, I knew I wanted to bring her up. Uh, I really recommend, if you want to get started with um, think, uh, AF's work, she put out this book, I think in 2017 with her sister, Syl, and also, if you don't have, you don't want to even delve into that, if you go to my website at veganfeministnetwork.com, they have published some essays on this very topic on the category of animal and also a non-human first, non-humans first. Yeah, that group. But she's also come out with a book uh, just last year. It's only a few months old. And you can see it's thin. It's got lots of pictures and drawings. So it's a really attractive way to introduce folks to this concept 
where she starts talking about this notion of animal as a social symbolic category. So we have to start moving away from those categories first and foremost. I mean, this is kind of quite radical thinking. Um, not just that we're allies with other animals, but we disrupt this whole meaning of animal to begin with. This category of animal kind of has to go. This difference barriers we've created between us. Is misanthropy or the dislike and hatred of humanity good for the animal movement? I think the movement issue there, um, and I suppose we ought to um, not shy away from it, is Yurovsky, I think. Um, I think that uh, Yurovsky has brought in a lot of, of uh, hatred for humanity on, 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 the, on the basis of his own personal position. And, um, you know, his, his view is still shared. And there was a lot of people in the vegan movement who tragically will defend you know, the, all the kind of appalling um, things that he said about, uh, about raping men and women. Uh, I was in a vegetarian slash vegan slash kind of animal rights um, university group at my last university in New Jersey. And in one meeting, we went around the table to introduce ourselves. There was like 30 people there. And, and I had to explain why, why we are in the movement, what brought us here to this table or whatever else. And I'd say one, well, one person started off and said, I saw the Yurovsky speech. And that just set off a chain reaction. Almost everyone around the table in that room said, oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that speech. And it really brought me to I'm sitting there. And then, when, of course, when it came around to me, I said, actually, this guy's the bait of my existence. And it's a wonder we stay in the movement because of this guy. But we have to give him credit. He's, for whatever reason, he's speaking to people and bringing them in. And this is a very peaceful table of people who were there to eat their little vegan Sunday meal. You know, they weren't the rah, rah, rah types. Do you think advocates for animal rights should try to work with advocates for human rights? If I could just chime in, I've got an experience to share with this topic at the risk of being burned at the stake. Um, I signed up for the NHS volunteer scheme for the COVID effort. And um, you, you, you download an app. And if there's any requests from people within your area, you get a notification. So it might be collecting medication, might be doing their shopping for them um, and other bits and bobs like that. So I got a notification from an elderly couple just down the road um, to do some shopping for them, which did include um, cow's milk and butter. Um, and obviously I was kind of thinking I'm an hour and about it, obviously felt very uncomfortable. But uh, in the end, I did buy it and I did deliver it for them. And how I rationalize that to myself is that, A, if it wasn't me volunteering to get that for them, someone else is just going to do it. Um, and also, I'm very recently starting to learn a bit more about how subsidies and bailouts impact supply and demand. And um, I just don't think that my one-off purchase of the dairy milk for this elderly couple has any real impact on the um the industry financially speaking to be honest the, the other thing is it's their money not yours like it's not exactly. like you're buying it for yourself and it's part of a bigger picture so i think i think they're 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 gray areas for me yeah and it looks like i'm um, looking at the poll results this to, to me this question is almost kind of reflected in these results you know working anytime we can get and also being mindful about it which i think are while kind of they're obviously related is really just kind of how mindful to be about this. Cause I think you could take the approach of, of, you know, not purchasing those things. I, yeah. I mean, your rationalization makes perfect sense to me, Brad, for what it's worth. Do you think the opposition towards human rights within the animal movement is holding us back? That looks like about three quarters of the room says that, yes, we can't properly address one without addressing the other. I would go back to focus the scope for myself because I, I think that a lot of these issues that we've dealt with are not really there in a way. How do you think we should discuss this issue with other animal advocates? To me, conversations like we're having today is where the, the really the opportunity to lie because even if um, we don't align, I think, I know I've learned a lot here today and been really enjoying this conversation. 
Yeah, I think part of this question, Jeremy, um, correct me if I'm wrong, was we were we were trying to see if we could tease out the difference between maybe calling out and calling in, I think, weren't we? Well, and I think to your point about the whole call out versus calling in, that seems to be consistent with the general vibe in the room, that reaching out privately is going to be a more successful tactic. I think that's less likely to evoke, um, you know, potentially a response coming from our own um, egos, not wanting to look bad in public and just really having you know, honest discussions. And uh, that I think to specify the whole call out versus calling in is specifically the public versus private discussions and really inviting someone to, to share ideas versus you're wrong, I'm right type of thing. So I, are you actually saying um, rather than commenting on a, on a Facebook post, you would, you would send them a, a private message? It's a really tricky one, I think, because, you know, it's not a perfect solution, is it? Because private messages can quite easily be ignored and the person can then subsequently pro block you. And to be honest, I'm not really sure what the answer is. If, if you reach out to someone privately and they block you, you know, do we then ignore them or do we try to address it publicly? I'm not sure what the answer is. I'd love to hear others' thoughts though. One of the advantages of doing it publicly is that there are people watching the conversation rather than taking part in the conversation. So the audience of discourse is, is just as important as the people participating. In fact, sometimes more so. You know, in the sense that if you, if you appear to be the person, you know, creating the kind of rational argument and uh, the reasoned argument and maybe behaving in a fairly diplomatic way and, you, and you're receiving kind of abusive responses, then I think that uh, has an effect in, in terms of people's assessment of, you know, what they've seen as, as discourse, you know. But you couldn't, yeah, believe... do, you couldn't do that as a PM. Yeah, we're dealing with people that um, uh, care about other animals. Obviously, they're, they're people that uh, are campaigning for non-human animals. They're people that believe in the rights of non-human animals, hopefully. Um, and, and I think what's important is, is, is to relate it to that, is to show how um, it's actually harmful uh, not to care about human rights. It's actually harmful the, to the cause of campaigning for non-human animals not to care about human rights. Um, and, and there's kind of two sides to this. I mean, I, 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 I said some while ago about um, in, in order to be logically opposed to speciesism, we have to be opposed to such things as racism, sexism and all that. I think the question is, will we ever get animal liberation on animal rights um, if we don't end all forms of oppression in terms of because it's a system systemic issue of having these oppressions? So can we get one without the other. And I think, in my opinion, is no. Um, even if we get some sort of rights, more like welfareist uh, rights for some for animals, we I think all oppressions are connected and will not end all oppressions. We need to look at the thing more in a bigger picture, more that is a systemic issue in our society to have this hierarchy, to have these oppressions one on top of the other. And I think that a lot of um, vegans, especially the ones who a lot of people mentioned before who don't agree on that or who, don't, who are not intersectional, they maybe don't agree with that or maybe they haven't even been educated on that uh, because it is more of a political issue or more of political understanding of how, um, how the world and politics work uh, rather than um, just about um, the animals. And I think that even though I think that they non-intersectional or single issue vegans wouldn't, they wouldn't think that all oppressions are connected. Um, well, they might think, but they don't want to discuss that because as you said, it might, it might take away the issue from the animal. They end up using that a lot of times on their arguments for veganism mentioning slavery for example which is um it's quite ironic how they do that uh so that was my my question was like can we i think that's something that we need to ask can we get animal liberations can we get the, the world to think of them as a sanctions that should be free uh from oppression will we be able to get that without thinking about all oppressions and any all that systemic problem that we have and I think many here, I, I, I think that we're not. And that's why we need to get educated on other issues. But I want to point out something that um, 
I have this kind of rule where I don't speak about something unless I like from a not to 10. If I don't know about something more than seven, then I don't speak about that issue. And I feel like for me, it's easy for me to speak about animals because it's something that I've been reading a lot about it. And I know about how they're being treated. And I've been vegan for so many years. Now, other issues like racism is something that I'm slowly being educated on. And that's not something that I'll be, um, will put all my energy into, not because I'm not against it. I'm not anti-racist. I am, of course. But it's just my, you only have 24 hours a day and there's only so much that you can learn about and fight for. Well, that's it for this episode of Common Ground. I really hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I know I did. Going into it, I used to think that this was a widely held view that the philosophy of animal rights is only about other animals. However, I'm beginning to wonder if this is perhaps a loud minority that holds these views and is, I think, maybe letting their passion to advance the plight of the, our fellow animals get in the way of learning about other issues and specifically how human rights struggles may relate to the struggle for animal rights, and that by understanding this relationship, we may be able to further advance the plight of other animals. If you feel like we've missed something and there's more to this topic than we may have addressed, please feel free to reach out to me and we can either talk about having a private discussion or another public Zoom call on it. Our hope is that in time we can fully address these issues. At the end of the call, we asked the group what they'd like to discuss next, and the front runner was um, campaign strategy. So I'm really excited to have that call here soon. So keep your eye out for that. If you want to be part of one of our live recordings, be sure to follow us on Facebook or Instagram. And if you think these topics are helpful to the animal movement, be sure to share it with your friends. We're not just trying to get as many people to these events as we can. We're really focused on getting passionate animal advocates there. So the invite friends feature on Facebook is a great way to target your friends who may be especially passionate about these topics so that we can bring the right people to these discussions. With that said, these live events are open to anyone who's interested in advancing the plight of our fellow animals. Also, if you enjoy the edited versions of these shows, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on the next one. Thanks for watching, and as always, please um, feel free to share your thoughts in the comments, and we'll see you in the next one.